What's up, y'all? Welcome to another episode of Rethinking Christianity. On today's episode, I sit down and talk with Alan Noble. Alan is an English professor at Oklahoma Baptist University, and he is also an author. He has a new book coming out called You Are Not Your Own, and the discussion around our conversation today is all about this book and the idea that maybe uh, we should not live in such an individualized society and that maybe we were meant to live for more than just being our own person. And so these are the observations that he presents in his book, and this is what our interview is about. If you could do me a huge favor by subscribing here on YouTube or checking us out on Apple or Spotify, wherever we have our interviews out, I would love for you to check that out and turn on notifications so that you know when a new episode is out or any content that is put out with Rethinking Christianity. With all that being being said, here is the interview with Alan. All right, Alan, thank you for coming on Rethinking Christianity. Alan is a professor at Oklahoma Baptist University, uh, and he is an author with InterVarsity Press, and he has a title coming out on September 28th called You Are Not Your Own, Belonging to God in an Inhuman World. And so we're super excited to have you on. I'm, I'm really glad to kind of have this conversation. So thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to, to do this. Sweet. So before we kind of dive into some of the subjects of the book, uh, I'd love for our listeners just to kind of hear a little bit about you uh, and how you kind of um, was led to, I, I think I read your, are you an English professor? Was that correct? Uh, yep. Technically awesome. I am. Yes. So what led you to, I guess, where you're at now and, and teaching and writing uh, and some of the stuff that, that you're currently working on and doing? So um, I was very homeschooled, and during one very formative um, year of my life, uh, a group of us homeschoolers read Francis Schaeffer's uh, How Then Should We Live, and um, Francis Schaeffer kind of blew my mind because here's this Christian who all these homeschool moms were saying is, is um, you know, orthodox, and he's wise, and but he was looking at secular culture and taking it for what it was, as opposed to uh, viewing secular culture with hostility. And in the 90s, growing up in sort of evangelical slash fundamentalist churches and homeschool movements, that was the predominant way we talked about society and culture was there's scary thing out there that's corrupting us unless we keep it away. And Schaefer, you know, watched foreign films and, you know, discussed them in a thoughtful way. Um, and that opened my mind uh, because I love music and I love film and I love books. And I just had no way of, you know, uh, relating my faith to those to those loves. And really, so from that point on, I've been concerned about how to help the church um, have a more faithful presence in in culture and participate in culture in a more faithful way. And the way my mind works, I like to think in terms of big systems. Um, um, so if there's, a, if there's one flaw in my writing, um, there's probably more than one. But if there's one, it's that I try to systemize things uh, 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 too much. But I like to look at trends. I like to look at patterns. And so over the years, as I've studied literature and read philosophy and different social commentaries, I've really become interested in the way that our society functions, how we treat each other, how our habits form us, um, and, and what those things tell us about our assumptions and our beliefs and uh, these sorts of things. So, um, yeah, so I teach at Oklahoma Baptist University, and um, that's, that's me. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, and so you have this title coming out that is one I find, I just kind of, as I was reading through some of the stuff about it, I found it really interesting because it's something that um, you can observe, but it almost feels like it's an impossible thing to deal with, it, I guess, on a societal level. But I think the stuff you talk about is really interesting. And so you kind of talk about this idea of um, the fundamental lie of, I guess, modern society or modern, mo modernity. Um, that we are our own. So I'd love to hear what, where did that kind of desire to write on that subject start? Um, because it's a very, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty big subject. So I'd love to just hear how did that passion and kind of that desire kind of begin? Um, so I was pulling together, and, and again, this is this big picture habit that I have, um, which doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily a good thing, but it is a thing. So I was pulling together various concerns that I had. On the one hand, there are these personal experiences that I had in, in a society that feels in some pretty fundamental ways inhuman. 
And so the question that would naturally rise my mind is, well, where is this coming from? Is there, is there a pattern? Because I feel like contemporary life, even though we have more and more advances and conveniences and we know more about the mind and the body and all these sorts of things, and yet it feels unbearable. Like it feels like we're constantly burnt out and exhausted and depressed and anxious. It doesn't feel like things are getting better. Some things measurably are. Uh, so f- for example, in, you know, in issues of race and diversity and things, we've, you know, thinking about America, we've made some real progress. We have ways to go, but we've made some real progress. But, but Otherwise, um, a lot of the things we think of as advances don't seem to compensate for the fact that a lot of people are very miserable. So I had these these personal experiences, and then I teach college students, many of them raised in, or most of them raised in Christian homes, um, who understand the gospel and understand their worth before Christ. And yet when it comes to the senior year, they almost to a person will have a kind of existential crisis. And uh, it comes from feeling this tremendous weight this society has put on them to craft a life. They see their life as a project and they have to create the right kind of project. Only they can make their life meaningful. Only they can determine when their life is meaningful. And um, there's this feeling that you can never do enough. You always have to keep trying harder and being more and more successful and um, feeling inadequate. Inadequate uh, is a, um, and unable to act is a very common response to that tremendous social pressure. So in other words, they'll come to me and say, I don't know what to do. Like I've been going to college and now I'm supposed to go get a job. I just, I just don't want to do any, like, I don't feel like I could do anything because the pressure is so great. So I had my personal experiences and then I had these uh, vicarious experiences where people were communicating to me about the difficulties of the contemporary world. And then, um, you know, uh, in my PhD, I studied secularization and I thought a lot about modernity and the changes from the enlightenment and what some of those changes are. And it just struck me one day that, um, that this idea that we are our own and belong to ourselves um, is at the core of a lot of the changes that we, that we see in the modern era. And um, so I connected the two and I thought, okay, well, what could, could this at least in part explain uh, some of these things and uh, I decided yes <laughs> it can't explain it so so that's the book exploring awesome. that question yeah yeah and I, I would uh, 100% relate to what you mentioned about so I graduated like 2018 or something like the end of 2017 okay. in December yeah and that first year out I was just, it was one of the worst years of like I I have experienced because I felt like Oh, I'm supposed to be able to get a job. So, you know, it's this idea that if you take the right steps, you'll get the right pathway or whatever. And so I, I 100% relate to that. Would you say that, and this is something, a conversation I have with a lot of people my age, um, and I've had it with my wife also, is this idea that you have to have like a purpose, like the, that you have to mm-hmm. have this identity and this purpose um, and something that I've talked about pe- with people is they've said, like, I don't know what like my life, like, can I not just live my life? Like, do I have to have this this ultimate purpose? Um, would you say that that's also kind of something that society has kind of shaped people into believing? There's actually a Pixar movie. I forget which one. It was really recently that came out that really dealt, I think it was called Soul, maybe. Um, yeah. But it deals with that whole issue of like identity and purpose. And the question was, is it really even necessary for you to have this complete purpose in life? Yes, that's a tricky question because on the one hand, um, okay, a certain understanding of purpose, yes, we do need. So life cannot be meaningless. And so in that sense, we have to have some some purpose. We have to be oriented towards, for example, the future. There, There has to be a reason that we put up with suffering. There has to be something that we're working toward that makes the suffering and the difficulties in life worth it. Otherwise, we're suckers for putting up with all this suffering, okay? So in that sense, everyone does need um, a a purpose. However, for the most part, when we talk about purpose and uh, the individual in the contemporary world, what we really mean is a a unique purpose or an individual purpose, right? So not a universal human purpose, which I would say is to, you know, uh, in uh, enjoy God, um, to know God and enjoy, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But instead, this 
personalized thing. Like I've got to have a certain kind of career or I've got this path or this is my shtick or this is my identity or this is my thing. And that is, a, um, that is absolutely part of this pressure. So one of the shifts that happens, and I don't go into the history of, of modernity and the enlightenment and stuff. Other people have done that and it's, I just didn't write that kind of book. But what I'll say is that one of the shifts that happens from the sort of medieval world to the modern world is that the, the individual, the self, has on the one hand absolute freedom to create uh, a life and a purpose and uh, a trajectory. And, and in many ways, that was a good thing, um, but it also created the obligation to create and sustain your own existence. So everyone feels this pressure. I have to create, I have to have a purpose. I have to discover what that purpose is. And uh, secular people feel it. Christians, you know, sometimes they'll say, I got to find my calling. And they mean it in a very specific, as, as if just being faithful to God wasn't our calling, right? Which it is. Yeah. Um, and so when you feel that, when you feel, again, there's that, that, that analogy or that language of a project, your life is a project or a story. You're the only one who can tell that story. You're the only one who can define the project, who can work on the project, who can decide when it's done. And uh, so you never feel complete. You always feel like it's not enough. Um, and so you're, you're, you know, there's that, that saying, you know, picking yourself up by the bootstraps, uh, yeah. um, you know, which is a, an absurdity because if you lift yourself by your, by your feet, um, you can't lift yourself yeah. by yourself. That doesn't work. But that's, that's kind of what the modern person is, is pressured to do. You have to, by yourself, make your life meaningful. And that's just not how that works. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that the, the, the idea of a universal purpose, I definitely agree is very necessary just for the health of society. Um, but that kind of the other side of that, the individual purpose is what I think people have kind of, or at least I have struggled with at times and what you, what all you had just talked about. Um, would you say that kind of this idea of like, you know, so the title of the book is like, you're not your own, but this idea or this lie of that you are your own, this individualized way of viewing living life. Do you feel like that that is kind of making um, the modern world sick in a way um, or the way society is shaping humanity is making the way individuals operate just kind of like sick, I guess you could say? Yes. Yeah, so the way I've come to understand it is I, I, I think for the most part, people in the church and outside the church um, assume the way they understand what it means to be a human being is that we are each fundamentally our own and we belong to ourselves. And because of that, um, we shape our laws, our values, our aesthetics, our morality, our ethics, our, our art, our entertainment, our habits, our practices, our uh, politics, everything um, around that understanding of what it means to be human. So for example, we even do this with fashion. For a contemporary person, one of the main tasks of your clothing is to portray your identity. Uh, because if you are your own, that's your task. You have to be someone and only you can make yourself someone. And you do that by expressing yourself constantly. So clothing has to be part of your identity. And the markets and, you know, uh, corporations and the media uh, assumes this and they teach you this. So from a very early age, you conceive of yourself as this project, this, this person that you are, that you are uh, redeeming, that you are making significant. And I do think that it, it does make us sick. And, and the reason for that is that I don't think what it means to be human is that fundamentally that we are our own. I think we, we belong to Christ. And because we belong to Christ, we also uh, have obligations to our neighbor and our families and to God's creation that we don't get to just dismiss um, or, or elect to, to recognize whenever we want. So if, if we're living in a society that doesn't really fundamentally understand us, we're going to feel anxious. We're going to feel depressed. We're going to feel, again, those pressures that those seniors often feel and, and adults feel often throughout their lives, this pressure to be someone. Um, you know, I said it, 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 at the beginning, part of the inspiration for this was just the, the experience of modern life, which is an experience of burnout for a lot of people. You feel exhausted all the time. You feel like you're not doing enough. You feel inadequate. You feel depressed. You feel anxious. You feel like 
There are a million ways that you were failing and falling behind and missing out. Um, and to live in that space perpetually um, does make us sick. And we know it too. That's one of the weird things is like, we know <laughs> that, that we're depressed and sick. Um, we just don't recognize the root causes. So instead we find ways of coping. Yeah, for sure. Do you feel like this is a, this topic? Um, I think it's something that definitely resonates with Christians um, because it, it kind of, at least in my faith and growing up, the idea of like belonging to Christ is a thing that is talked about. But, you know, I think these subjects are still like applicable to those that are, I guess you could call secular or whatever, that are non-Christian. Do you feel like this conversation is something that resonates with people that are, are, are not Christian? Uh, also, or have you been able to have conversations with people around this idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I would say is that, that the response, which is that we are not our own, but belong to Christ is very difficult for, it's very difficult for Christians to accept. I mean, we can say it like, oh, I, yeah, believe, yeah. I belong to Christ. But the actual idea is, is kind of frightening for a modern person because it means letting go of autonomy. It means recognizing that that there is a source of authority outside of yourself. And that makes us very uncomfortable. And I think most people in the church continue to operate based on that contemporary anthropology, thinking that they are their own. And really, they're just choosing Christianity because it's helpful to them or it's productive for them or it works for them. We'll say, oh, Christianity works for you. Good for you, but it doesn't work for me. So that aspect of it, I think, is, is, is very difficult for Christians, but especially for secular people, because it is it feels so unnatural to the modern way that we live. Yeah. That said, um, particularly the first half of the book, where I'm describing, you know, the implications of living in this world that assumes that we belong to ourselves. I think, or at least I've I've tried to write a book that that's not directed, you know, in uh, primarily at Christians, but is just yeah. at anyone living in this world who has experienced these traumas, these sufferings, these burdens, and how inhuman they are, and wants a, some kind of explanation for where they're coming from, where these things are coming from. And so I would, um, I would say that if you're someone who's not a Christian, and you're, uh, you know, a little put off by that title to, to consider, to read through and consider, especially the first half. Um, and I think you might find that it's um, more reasonable than you, than you suspect. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think in I, at the very beginning, and so I'm glad you kind of brought that the, the first half of the book. At least I think this is at the very beginning. Um, there is a excerpt that kind of talks about uh, this idea or this illustration of lions uh, and or was it tigers on, in zoocosis? Is that am mm -hmm. I pronouncing that word right? So yeah. I when I was reading through this, I was like, this is like a great illustration for just America. At least on, in America, I know American society. Uh, and this, I think, long this human longing for something more, uh, and yeah. that is is kind of we've been what we've been talking about. We've been tricked into believing this idea that it can be resolved by all this other stuff. Um, so I'd love for you to just kind of like I don't want to give it away. So I'd love for yeah. you to kind of explain that this idea of like lions and and zoocosis. Yes. So zoocosis is, it's not a technical term, but it's a popular term for that condition that animals have in, um, in captivity. When you, uh, you see them in the zoo and typically there's like a track that you can see it's a lion or a bear or a similar animal. And they've been pacing around typically in like a circle or, you know, some, yeah, some kind of a circle and you can see it on the ground. There'll be like all this grass, but then there's this path. And it's not just because they use that path as they wander around and play during the day. It's because that animal is walking in circles all day long which we would say if a human did it is a sign of mental illness, right? Like some, something, something is deeply wrong. And in fact, that's what zoocosis means. It's a, it's a, a psychosis and mental, you know, uh, suffering for experienced by a, an animal in captivity. And um, what, what, what I've had super fascinating about zoocosis is when you think about a modern zoo, these are habitats that were designed by people who knew who know you know more about let's say a black bear than a black bear knows about itself in a sense right they know about their diet they know all these things about the history and the evolution and all these things about so they can design it very intentionally 
experts working at this, and yet they create these habitats where these bears are sick. They're fundamentally sick. So that's striking to me, that you can intentionally make a, a habitat for, for an animal that is still not actually for that animal as it really is. It's for, in the book, what I, you know, a, 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 a mythical animal, a, 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 let's say a brown bear that could live in a zoo, which is not right. Um, and so what happens when these animals experience this zoocosis is, uh, when I read this, I just felt like, oh my gosh, this is me. So the two of the things that they do is they'll give them enrichment opportunities or enrichment activities. So like they'll put a, like a, a ball in there or you know like a, a log for them to play on or a swing or something, or they'll give them antidepressants. And yeah, and so when I read that, I was like, that's, oh my gosh, is this me? Like, do I have psychosis? Because I feel like that's what society does with me. It's like, here, if you're, if you're miserable in this society that doesn't work really well, then uh, try these antidepressants. And uh, here's some things to distract you. Here's a ball. Here's a cell phone. You know, go play. Um, so yeah, I think that describes in many ways our modern condition where it, you know, it's a little bit exaggerated. I don't think we're caged animals, but, um, but it is helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I was, yeah. When I read that, I was like, wow, this is very uh, concerning one. I feel bad for those animals, but also I kind of, it, it definitely relates to the society that we're, we're kind of in right now. Do you, so, and you kind of mentioned, you didn't write like a, a history on this, this subject, but do, in, in kind of your study, have you found or like can point to maybe a shifting point uh, at least maybe in American culture where it really began to shift towards um, this idea of like, just one that being, being your own, um, do you feel like there's a time period or some, some type of invention invention or, or anything that kind of shifted, um, into that direction or was it kind of just a slow kind of fade? Yeah. So there are certain points that accelerated the process. The process begins before the nation is, is, is begun, right? It, it really begins with the enlightenment and the idea that each person has the obligation to question truth and to determine truth for themselves, as opposed to relying upon religious authorities or political authorities or, um, you know, uh, kin authorities, you know, you know, family members or community authorities to, to give you that kind of guidance. Instead, we all have to figure it out for ourselves. That enlightenment idea um, starts off, but it, it, it takes a long time to get to, to where we are today. It doesn't quite settle in. So in an early America, there's still a strong sense of of, of volunteerism. So um, in early America, there's still a, a fairly strong sense that you have obligations to your community and you can't just do whatever you want, or you have obligations to your family. Um, and there are still pockets in America where that happens, particularly immigrant, immigrant communities. Typically, I, in, from what I understand, the first and second generation of, of an immigrant community um, from many places in the world, they will still retain that sense that they have obligations to their family that are good and natural and that they should respect. But um, after a while, American culture uh, gets to them and pretty soon um, they see themselves primarily as autonomous individuals rather than belonging and being embodied in a family and a community and a place and a time. Um, but some of those acceleration points, you know, I would say, um, you know, the First and Second World War accelerate that. The rise of mass media uh, accelerates that. There's this, you know, moment in the early 20th century where we have the First World War. We have massive changes in transportation and technology and communication. There's uh, Darwinism and Freud and Nietzsche all sort of questioning traditional authorities. And that creates a a kind of mood that you see in modernist authors where they're um, really increasingly feeling this burden of individualism. And by the time we get to, um, you know, the end of the Second World War, it's, um, you know, it's very common. And I will say that, that, that one of the influences is, is consumerism, because frankly, when you have people who feel this anxious need to express themselves and to make themselves, they spend a lot of money because it's existential. Like if I don't, if, if I, if I can't make something interesting out of my life, my life is purposeless. So I better spend to do that. So um, also the rise of American consumerism after the second world war, I think that's one of these forces that accelerates that. 
Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I think about is, and this obviously goes way back. And honestly, I didn't realize it. I mean, I guess philosophically it goes way back. Um, The things that I kind of just immediately recognize in our society is we are at a point in time where if anyone wants to try to have their own personal brand, uh, they can do that through social media. Whereas even uh, not that far back into like the nineties, you had to have like before the internet, you had to have and know the right people. So it's just insane. And it begins this thing of comparison, like, oh, well, this person's doing this. I I see it in, you know, in high schoolers that were, because there was a certain time, I'm 26, where, you know, we didn't really have Instagram growing up. And that wasn't that long ago. But I now know, like high schoolers, their whole life, they have had that. And then you just see the difference of, like they're kind of, I wouldn't call it innocence or anything. It's just a very different way of operating within life at their age where I didn't really think about things the way in which they do. And it's kind of an interesting kind of dynamic there. Yeah. High schoolers are always concerned about presenting themselves to the world. Um, But you're absolutely right that, that social media, especially platforms like Instagram, give you increasing numbers of tools and opportunities to present yourself to the world and to perfect that presentation and to improve that presentation and to multiply that presentation so that that now, um, you know, we all essentially walk around or at least, you know, many people walk around um, a, as if we were the you know, movie stars in the 1940s, where um, our, our love life is something that's publicly described. Uh, we have, uh, you know, professional shots that are published. You know, we're expressing our opinions it, publicly to the entire world as if we are these celebrities. And there is a tremendous pressure. And, you know, uh, part of that pressure is competition. Because if we're all working, striving to create a, a, a meaningful life, um, we're, we all end up competing against each other. So your success is, you know, is challenged by my success. And so, and social media just makes that worse because I can see you having a great vacation in the Bahamas or whatever. And so then I'm like, man, my life is a failure. I guess I need to work harder. And, um, you know, it just, it just gets worse. Yeah, I'd love to talk for really quickly. So I watched some YouTube videos that you did in regards to the book uh, and you talk about, and I think this is something I guess people probably, I guess you can really recognize within the last couple of years about like workforce and, um, Mm -hmm. and things like that. And I guess the impact of this concept or this philosophy of individualism and the impact it has on companies and the way people operate in the workforce and, and productivity and efficiency. And one of the things you point out that I'd never really thought about very often is the idea that um, people are given like vacation or lunch breaks or, or whatever it may be simply for the sake of improving the efficiency or the output or the income of the companies. And so it's, it's almost like I think you mentioned in the video, it becomes an issue when treating people with dignity is no longer a way to reach more efficiency. And so I'd love to kind of hear some of your kind of thinking on that. So there's a recent um, article I read in, I think the Harvard Business Review, it was this company did, did this survey asking employees what perks they wanted most in their jobs. And the number one perk that people in the study um, asked for was um, natural lighting. Um, so uh, in other words, the thing that American employees want the most is sunlight. Um, now, you know, if you, if you frame it in terms of like, well, everyone wants an an office with a window, it doesn't sound that depressing, but when you recognize that people are asking to see the sun, that's really depressing. Like, uh, it suggests that, that our society and our priorities are so malformed that we can assume that people don't need sunlight, which God has created us. Um, and we have the sun and this is a natural way to live, to, to see the sun. And, um, So what was interesting about this article was um, the company immediately or the the writer immediately goes on to say, and also, uh, I don't, this is a paraphrase, but um, direct sunlight has, you know, proven to increase productivity or whatever um, by so-and-so percent. 
And that's super fascinating to me because essentially what they're, they're admitting is, okay, people have this desire for sunlight and um, this is what they're saying they really want. And we should give it to them because it will make us more money. Um, not because this is how humans were designed to live, that they, they have some sunlight, you know, um, but instead because it's productive. Now, what I try to argue in the book is that when we are each our own, uh, value systems start falling flat. They start falling aside because there are no longer shared values. Instead, we're each just on our own. I have my values, you have yours. But there's one value that I think lingers, and that is efficiency. Because the fact is, when we can talk numbers, it's easy to negotiate. So you and I were, you know, you know, us and you know, other people in the world might not be able to agree on, let's say, sexual morality, but we can agree that we want sexual assault numbers to go down. We can agree that we want venereal diseases to go down. Or um, we might not be able to uh, agree on whether it's um, you know, the ethical responsibility of a company to provide employees with um, sunlight or, or a healthy work environment, but we can agree <laughs> that uh, increasing productivity is beneficial and good. And so what happens is that I, I do think, um, and here I'm working with this, the ideas for this uh, of a French philosopher named Jacques Ellul, uh, and he, he argues in the technological society that technique is this powerful, powerful force in the modern world. And by technique, he means methods for increasing efficiency. And I think he's right. Um, I think when, when we are our own, what we end up falling back on is efficiency. And we no longer have a sense of responsibility to, let's say, employers uh, or employees that you know, we need to treat them with dignity and respect as humans. We need to Instead, we just need to treat them with respect insofar as it increases profitability or efficiency. And as you mentioned, the problem, well, that's problematic in itself, yeah. but the problem really shows up when, okay, what happens when, let's say I can get you, uh, let's say they design a light that accurately mimics natural lighting. <laughs> now is it okay? Right? Yeah. Or, or what if I can give you a pill or a vitamin supplement that gives you the benefits of physical benefits of natural lighting without actually giving you a window. Does it matter? Do I still have to treat you humanely by giving you lighting? Um, and so this leads to all kinds of problems. Yeah, it, it, it definitely does. I, and I am, you know, I try to think through these things because I am thankful. I'm, I'm not necessarily in that kind of situation, but there's so many people that are having to work in these kind of ways. I mean, and they're trying to make ends meet uh, and they have really, honestly, in, a, in the way our world works is no real choice in the matter of like, right. they have to, I mean, they have to pay their bills. They have to do what's right. And so when, and it's like, I kind of begin to ask myself the question of like, how am I part of this problem? Like, is my yeah. consumerism driving these issues? Uh, and, and so I would love to kind of, as I've kind of addressed that myself, and I think for, for me personally, the way of Jesus, I think, is brings resolve to some of these things. Um, maybe not, it doesn't resolve it necessarily, the specific issues in, in America, like practically, uh, because not everyone is going to follow Jesus. Um, but for me individually, it begins to help me like work out of different convictions rather than this idea of being my own. Um, okay. And so you kind of talk about, uh, I, I want to pronounce this correctly, is it the Heidelberg Catechism? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it answers the question, uh, what is your only comfort in life and death? Uh, yeah. And I found this to be really good. And I have it here. I, you, you probably have it memorized. Um, but I, I, if you want to kind of Go quote ahead. it. No. Uh, so no. it says that I am not my own, but belong with my body and soul, both in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And that first part that, that I am not my own uh, is such a, and you've kind of, we've already mentioned this. It's so opposite of what, especially people that are being born now in, in 20 years, they will have probably not often thought of that concept of that. I'm not my own. Um, whereas maybe past generations, maybe in a little bit ha, would have, would have thought in that way. Um, so how is the, how do you find this to be the resolution um, I guess on an individual level. Yeah. So first of all, I find it incredibly fascinating that these, the Heidelberg divines, that's the name for the authors of this catechism. And, uh, you know, 500 years ago, essentially, um, when they're asking this question, first, the fact that they, the, the first question they ask about trying to, 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 to describe the Christian faith is what is our comfort? 
um, which really resonates with me because I feel like I really do need comfort in life and in death because uh, life and death are filled with discomfort and anxiety. So I'm really fascinated by the fact that they essentially begin with this, this problem of existential dread, right? Like you need something to comfort you. But then the idea that you, as, as you said, it's very counterintuitive that we are not your own, that being the comfort. I think for most modern people, being our own is the one thing that does provide us comfort because now other people can't harm us or control us. We are the, you know, the captains of our own ships. Um, but this says, mm, no, actually, it's the fact that we belong to God that grounds us. So in the book, um, you know, I, and I, and I discuss this in the book, I, I would love to have written a book where I say, here are the five steps to getting rid of all this anxiety, getting rid of our zucosis, right? And to fixing societies that we live in, in a humane society. But um, this is not a work of fiction. So I have to just be honest and, and say, um, I think there are real and meaningful things that we can do in our personal lives and in our public spheres um, to make changes and to challenge these lies about what it means to be human. But um, I don't have any faith that we are going to radically change society. So this is not a, uh, here's how we redeem society. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so for, for example, um, if you help employees recognize that very often their employers are going to treat them humanely only when it's economically beneficial, that's helpful for them. That's helpful for them because they can see how they're being valued and they can push back against it and recognize, hey, you know what? Actually, my worth is not... Uh, established by my efficiency. It's not determined by how efficient and productive I am. It's actually uh, uh, established in the fact that I'm made in the image of God. All right. So that's helpful. But the reality is their employer is still going to treat them that way. Yeah. And the rest of society is still going to treat them that way. And so this is one of the points I try to make in the book is that, that um, the first step is having the discernment, having the language and the ability to call out these lies, to identify them and label them. And that gives you some agency to push back but the structures of society are still gonna be there. And that means that we have to have grace for, for other people. And we have to, uh, I think, have grace for ourselves and recognize that it's still gonna be really hard. It's still gonna be stressful. It's still gonna be, um, uh, you know, we're gonna have anxious lives because we're still gonna live in that caged environment. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think, um, you know, having those, that, that, that language and having that understanding uh, does give you some agency and does, lift um, some of that weight. It is a comfort as the, as a Heidelberg catechism says. And it also means that, you know, you were talking about, okay, well, you know, reframing the way you think about how you interact with the world. Um, so I, although I, I'm not prescribing or advocating for a system-wide change, because I don't even know what that would be. I'm not going to be presumptuous enough to say that or arrogant enough, but I do think that there are real meaningful changes that we can make in our own spheres of influence. So if you own a business, the way you treat your employees and your customers, you have control over that and you can change that. Um, if you're employed somewhere, the way you treat customers, that you can change that. And colleagues, you can change that. So there are ways that we can uh, make our little spheres of, of, of life more human. And in that sense, glorify God and um, help our neighbors not to live in such a stressful and you know um you know painful world but we need to go into this not thinking i'm going to save the world by making these changes instead we need to think in terms of faithfulness my task before god is to be faithful to love my neighbor and to treat them as human beings made in the image of god and living before god right now wherever i am um my job is not to save the world because when people begin to think that they they can save the world, that um, a lot of a lot of harm often comes from that. Yeah, and that honestly kind of fits into the uh, like if you believe that you can save the world yourself, it honestly fits right into this idea. Oh, I'm I'm my own. I can do this. Like it's it goes right alongside of this issue that we're kind of talking about. Uh, and so yeah, I would 100% agree with with all of that. And I think it's. You know, one of those things that is it should be challenging because as you observe it, like we have a mental health crisis going on. We have the 
income to debt ratio is insane. And so it's just there's this it's like this boiling of things that, um, like I mentioned earlier, and, and it's, uh, you know, people are just trying to make ends meet and they're trying to live their lives. Yeah. And, and that's, that's right. what the struggle is. And that's where I have to learn to work with much more empathy and grace. And when, when I hear people's problems or their stresses, I have to begin to like ask the question of, okay, how do I put myself in those people's shoes? Um, yeah. And then how do I show them this grace of Jesus while not like, I guess, patronizing the stuff that they're going through? Uh, and so there's a very fine balance for, I think, us as, as you know, as followers of Jesus. Um, so, yeah, and I, I just find this this conversation really helpful, and I think it's really needed. I think it's something that um, I think pastors and churches should be talking about more um, because it deals with the real life stuff that, that people are, are going through. Um, so I, I'd love to kind of hear, and you kind of mentioned um, how employees kind of work can, or employers can work with employees, and that's pretty practical. Um, do you have any other kind of on a practical level um, kind of what that could look like, what this idea could look like for people on a day-to-day basis? Hmm. That's kind of a uh, difficult question, I guess. It is. The challenge of this question, it's a good question. It's a meaningful question because that's the, where the rubber meets the road, right? So what do we do about this? The difficulty of that question is if the problem is as deep and broad as I've described, then the response to it has to be equally deep and broad. So whatever kind of life you're living, like whatever career you have or don't have, you know, whoever you're living with or your community is, whatever your situation, there are going to be specific ways that you can do this that uh, I, I actually haven't even thought of. So one of the things that I, I, I talk about in the book is, is actually working as communities, as church communities to, to, to think through this. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we can, we can do when we when we, as communities, make a conscious effort to live as belonging to Christ, um, then what we can do is we can exhort each other and encourage each other in our own daily lives to live out those, those expectations. Um, and doing that with grace, and I, I love the example you gave, you know, you mentioned that people are just trying to get by. And what that means is that, you know, what we can't do is put unrealistic burdens upon people and say to them, you know what, you need to stop participating in a system that is inhuman. So quit your job and stop buying all these things and, you know, stop doing all these, you know, just totally drop out and radically change your life. Um, I just don't think, I don't think that's fair to ask. I don't think that's fair to ask. I don't think it's reasonable. And so what we have to do is we have to support each other and encourage each other in our local communities, we have to look for opportunities. I think um, one of the things that practically that I think about is the way we talk about careers and futures, uh, especially when we're talking to young people, because I think it's very common for young Christians to feel that fundamentally, again, their life is a project and they've been told this by their parents, by elders, by pastors, whatever, I'm not in that language, but there's still that pressure. They've still been taught it in some way that they've got to make something interesting and meaningful and exciting and powerful or whatever, a popular out of their life. Um, so one practical thing I think we can do is when we're talking to people about, okay, preparing for a career, preparing for a future, um, inviting them to consider when they're doing their calculations, uh, not just what they're good at, not just what they can make money at, right? Because if, you know, if you can't feed yourself then it's not actually helpful, um, not just what is um, in, in demand, but also what does your community need? Mm -hmm. Because very often, I think we just ask a few of those questions. We ask, okay, what am I good at? What do I enjoy doing? And what can I get paid for? And those are three valuable questions. But if we're not around, we also have to ask, what does my community need? And so that might mean you look around and you think, you know what, I want to be another pastor, but maybe your, your hometown doesn't need another pastor. Maybe it doesn't need another doctor. Maybe it needs a public school teacher that's going to be underpaid and works tirelessly, but that's what your community needs. Somebody who's dedicated to raising and caring for and educating children, right? Um, so I think that's just one small thing that we could do that could radically reshape the way we think about the trajectory and purpose and drive of our lives. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Because I, when I look at, when I think about the words of Jesus, he mentions the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. And that yeah. what you're mentioning is literally the ultimate example of like putting aside maybe the desires and wants that we have and looking at the community. Cause, cause I think there's a, there could be a whole nother conversation on this of like, yes, we're not our own and we belong to God. And out of that, we should also be belonging to a community of people that hold to those same values. Uh, and so serving them out of this, like laying down this individualized kind of mindset. Uh, and so I, I mean, that is really challenging um, because it, it, it requires us to like question, like, am I okay with giving up the things that I want most for the betterment of others? Um, and it, and that's, that's very hard. And that's what, you know, following Jesus is not an easy, is not yes. an easy ask. And so, that's right. um, but yeah, so I, you know, these, as we're kind of talking, this is challenging me. So thanks. For, <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, this conversation. I'd love to hear um, kind of, as we kind of close out what, so what is your ultimate just hope for people that read this book uh, and yeah. wrestle with these thoughts? Um, yeah. So I'd love to just kind of hear that. So I, uh, two, I think two big goals. One is that I want people who are living um, under pressures that are inhuman to um, be equipped to recognize that those pressures really are inhuman and that they're wrong and that they're lies and that they don't have to submit to them, um, that they are, um, they're false. And that, uh, that, by belonging uh, to God, by living before God, um, we have identity, we have meaning, we have value, we have purpose, we have direction, and we don't have to cobble together a meaningful project of a life, which is an impossible task. Uh, that lifts a tremendous burden off of us. Uh, uh, and then the second part is actually putting another burden back, uh, putting a different burden on us. Because when we're not our own, that means, as you said, we have to be willing to sacrifice things. You know, um, parents feel this all the time. You've got to be able to say, uh, I'm not going to do this thing that I really want to do. Um, well, last, uh, this is petty, but last night I wanted to go to a, a talk that my friend was giving, a, an Old Testament scholar. And um, my son had a really bad day at school. And uh, I couldn't go to the talk. Like, I just, I mean, my wife was going to take care of the kids and she was fine. She's like, go. But I... I knew I needed to be home so I could talk to my son and help him work through what, what he was going through. I mean, okay, that's petty, but, but the point is, if you accept this, there are going to be some significant, burden. there are going to be things that you really desire to do that you're going to have to say, that's not actually loving. That's not actually honoring to God. That's not actually loving it. So I'm going to set that desire aside and do what is right because I'm not my own. I, got, I don't get to just do what I want. Now, let me pause here and, 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 and have just a, a brief aside about a, a, abuse because um, this is not uh, a, an excuse or a, a um, condoning any abuse. And what I'm not saying is let people walk all over you and suffer abuse in a yeah. church or a family or something like that. That actually, because you are not your own and belong to Christ, um, your self-worth means that you, you do not do that, that it's actually honoring to God to reject abuse and to get out of those situations. Um, but in non-abusive situations, you're still going to have to sacrifice. And so I guess in one way, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help people see that this burden that they feel is not really on them. It's a false burden society's placed. And instead to recognize they have another burden, but it's a manageable burden. And it's a good burden. It's a burden for the good of your neighbor. And that's a beautiful and, and, and it's a burden that doesn't determine your worth. That's, a, that's the key thing, right? So like this burden of loving and sacrificing for your neighbor, this is not what makes you good. This is not what makes you meaningful. This is not what gives you identity. It's because you have those things that you seek to honor and love and treat your neighbor with dignity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. That's my goal. That's awesome. And I would, you know, and what you mentioned about that, that burden, um, it's kind of an interesting thing because it's a, a burden that when you live it out, and I think this is applicable for Christians and non-Christians serving the fellow human, I think brings fulfillment um, in a way that is just like unexplainable. And I believe yeah. as a Christian, I believe there's a reason that that's unexplained. It is inexplainable because it's the way 
that Jesus presents and the way that, that God wants us to live our lives out. And so I think that that's what's so cool about that idea is that um, when you have this burden, it is one that does bring fulfillment uh, in a different kind of way, not in the way in which maybe we've been taught to believe that we ought to have fulfillment, but in a very, very different kind of way. So Alan, I really appreciate you coming on today um, and just kind of talking through this book. I'm I'm definitely going to read through it and um, it's challenging for me. I'm going to request this to to other people. I'm telling them they need to get a hold of this. I think it's something that our our society is dealing with and will continue to deal with. Um, So Alan, thank you so much for for coming on Rethinking Christianity and, and chatting with me today. Thanks. It's been wonderful. Thank you.